new series. All right, so we preface this with our C finale that we're going to start doing another Apple TV exclusive, which is the Foundation series. It is also a novel. I mean, it's kind of crazy. There's all of these sci-fi novels that were written in the, like, 60s-ish. I'm confirming really quick. So the first book of the Foundation series came out in 1951. You're good. I was just saying, wow, that's, that's basically my thought was, like, that is pretty recent after World War II. So I'm sure there was, like, some planning. I'm sure he had this idea in his head because this is, this is huge. Yeah, so it says here it had a short story series first in 1942 to 1950. So there was like an eight-year gap of, or eight years of short stories written about this, and then it became the three collections from 51 to 53. Jesus. So that's, that's I mean, that's, that's really a long, That's a long time of writing about one idea. It's a very long time. But I mean, we can already see in one episode there's a lot there. <laughs> there's like a lot so it's like i can't imagine how many months years or however long he spent just like daydreaming and figuring out the key players and how you know these people interact with these people and just the world itself and how it got there and just i mean it's extensive it's, it's huge yeah um, it's crazy honestly and i feel like the time here i know this isn't necessarily about the show but kind of the origin of the of the the story it's interesting that you know he would have been planning this around around Great Depression era. I'm just kind of looking at his uh, Wikipedia page really quick. So it says, oh my Lord, he's a prolific writer and wrote or, wrote or edited more than 500 books. He also wrote an estimated 90,000 letters and postcards, but he's best known for his work in science fiction, but he also wrote some mysteries and fantasy. It says here that the Foundation series, the first three books of which won the one-time Hugo Award for best all-time series in 1966. So that's what we're watching here. And he's also, aside from being a writer, though, he was also a professor of biochemistry. He was educated in Columbia uh, University and got a PhD. So he's a smart dude, <laughs> to say the least. Jeez. Or a well-educated person. He was, his worked at the Boston University. Hmm. So that's where he was. Where he teach or research? That was where he taught. Okay. at least to, at least from a scientific that's what it says on her scientific career i didn't okay. read all of this it's really interesting because you're, you're looking at these guys who are kind of foundational to the science of that period who go on to being these like foundational sci-fi writers like me and you as we said it while we were watching this first episode how much of it is in for like we're pulling from the ideas that we grew up with with the sci-fi we know like around video games like it's kind of weird right like it went from generation in the past it was like books and then film and then for us it was like the video games of the sci-fi world that were all informed by these really old books that are now being made into modern tv shows or films it's really interesting it's crazy it's like the cycle never ends right you just keep regurgitating uh, <laughs> and all these ideas but it's good because we've been like primed to it yeah you know I mean? so like now at this point we watch these things we're like oh that looks like this and right then, <laughs> it's not as weird can you imagine, like, if you're trying to read a book of this and you have no idea, like, how to, like, think about these ideas, like, all of this, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but, like, showing the space elevator or, like, some of these spaceships and stuff, like, yeah. we've been exposed to it since we were little, but can you imagine reading it as you're like, what? There's no such thing as things that fly like that. <laughs> Picture it with just words. It's like, I don't, I can't process what that looks like. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? uh, it's crazy, but it's really cool. And to see it now, like to see these things like being realized, it's like, it just looks cool. Like at the very least, say what you will about whatever, but like, it just looks cool. Even Star Wars with yeah. where they were, they were going off, but like even Star Wars is like, they were using toys. I'm pretty sure. They Basically. Like, I, do. I mean, <laughs> like, cool. I think that's part of what is really interesting about something like Star Wars or translating these really hard sci-fi things to either small screen, like TV shows or big screen or rather silver screen, like movies, is is you have to be really clever in how you're showing your ideas because many times you're portraying a reality that doesn't exist, right? Like, <laughs> and up until, I mean, even Star Wars, I think that shows its age nowadays just because of how far computer graphics have gone, but because they were able to do so much with model work, they were able to sell it a lot better than if they were to do it in any other form. And I think that attention to detail shows 
And I think even in this show, it shows too, like you were trying to say early on, because like, I would say probably the first half to three quarters of this total runtime of this episode is like world building and setting you up for like what's going on in this world or like giving you a feel for it, but without really dialogue or narrative attached to it. It's like thing, like especially even the opener, like it's just a group of kids and they kind of talk about this vault thing, which is just the floating like triangular shaped object. And there's a whole bunch of flags around it. And they try to get as far away or close to it as possible without blacking out or just having some weird psychic thing happen to them. And, uh, no context given. Like, that's really all we get. <laughs> I remember watching that and I'm like, I don't know if I understood any of that, but like, I mean, you get the concept of what the kids are doing, but like, right. I'm like, what? You just have no idea what that thing is. <laughs> and it's funny because at the end, we were both just like, huh, that's a lot. That was a lot. <laughs> you know, and it was. I mean, it's, it, it was a lot of exposition, but it, it is, it's, if they, if you didn't have this, I'm assuming, because, you know, we have nine ten, more. Ten, yeah, 10 episodes total. Yeah, so we need that to kind of understand who these characters are and like where they're positioned in the world and things like that. And then kind of just getting the technology of things too, because again, it is science fiction. These these things don't exist. Um, so you kind of have to explain things or else right. you just like, what? <laughs> you know, we just be lost the whole time. Yeah, <laughs> like I think pilots for sci-fi are do, like they have to do a lot of different things or they have to do more than your average pilot, I, I think, because typically your pilot is about, you know, introducing you to the world and then introducing you to the, your main protagonist or antagonist of the story, and then allowing you to kind of like sit with them for a little while and kind of get a feel for who they are. But because you're dealing with this completely unknown world or universe for this type of story, they have to do so much more double duty to be like, here's the people in the world and here's how this world operates. And a lot of times it's going to be super foreign to our, you know, whatever, whoever you are coming into it, it's, it's supposed to feel weird for lack of a better word. It's supposed to feel alien. <laughs> yeah, literally. And I mean, that's a cool note about the genre in and of itself, right? Cause you know, you can have a historical, especially historical fiction. I feel like that would be like almost the exact opposite if you want to go there, because it's stuff that has already happened. So mm -hmm. you're not getting new things. You're just regurgitating, retelling is a better word, uh, retelling um, a story that already occurred. Right. Yeah. But in that, this is like completely alien, like, like you said, ideas and concepts. So, I mean, you really need to get people, get the audience on board and to understand like the, I did this a lot with C and I don't do this on purpose, but to get the foundation of the show. <laughs> like to, <laughs> And I swear I don't do it on purpose, <laughs> but so then people know, you know, you can build upon that to get an understanding of what you're dealing with. That's part of why I really like sci-fi and I'm starting to like it even more because if you do it well, you kind of, you get to master exposition, right? Yeah. That's one of the things that it can, exposition can be really bad. And like, in some of the like anime shows I watch, it's like overly some like simplistic, or it's just like, they literally tell you exactly like on the nose description of what you're already saying. It's just like, I love, I love my favorite ones with like anime is when you have your antagonist or protagonist describing what their combat, the other combatant is doing like, oh no, he's got the ancient blade of whatever. I can't beat that. If you hit the, you're like, please stop it. Like unnecessary. Or after they do something and then they literally go back and retell you what that you just saw them do. Like what I just did what. I need my belt. So I was like, what are you talking? I just saw you do it. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> it's like, all right, whatever. So that's why it's cool in, in the sci-fi genre, because again, you don't want to bore people. Right. And that's one thing about this pilot. I will say it, it kept me engaged, even though there was, there was a lot of like, what is going on, but it, even though it was a little slower paced, it never became boring. Right. Yeah. It, it was, I think it was trying to. I think it did a good job of kind of getting you involved with these different characters. And then the characters that you, like the main characters you get to meet, cause it's like, I think it took like 10 minutes or so for you to meet Gail, who is your, are like, I'm going to call her the pro protagonist. And maybe she, she kind of is because she's like the off world or new to this, like the home world or whatever you want to call it, Imperial home world, I guess. And it's really interesting that all these sci-fi from this, like, time period was all around imperial stuff like 
and then Star Wars kind of popularized that with this with like or like stylized it even more. I guess I don't know. Even um, that wasn't that wouldn't have been much after. Foundation. Yeah, Dune was sixty five, so this is prior to Dune, or yeah, this came out. The book of this came out before Dune, so yeah, it, it, all of these are kind of bouncing off of each other with this imperial idea. <laughs> cool, that's cool. I wonder, like, if I'm gonna forget his name, I apologize, but the the author, the original art, author of Dune read the foundation books i feel like he probably i i would assume he would have if yeah. if he likes the genre enough right like you could imagine that like all these people were were feeding each other for, off of each other's ideas at some point and being like oh that's a cool point or they're yeah. or they're thinking about it too because like you said this is close to world war ii and like that was where i, I believe lucas got the idea of stormtroopers was from the ss german like bucketheads is what they call them because their helmets are really distinct and so he kind of just took that idea of like imperial soldiers all faceless nameless you know grunts and then just kind of turned into 11 and and you know that's how you get stormtroopers and then you just build a whole ethos around that like you know just following orders ideal but yeah i think it's a cool story i think uh, the other part of this too that i i thought was really interesting is they were they've nailed the costume design throughout the different groups and as you see more and more of it you get to see different people in different like i guess planets i guess is the right word i think that's the right word <laughs> yeah yeah and and they have like their own very like distinct styles and even our main character they call are they mention that she doesn't have what are called prayer beads and so if you have like right underneath her eyes like along the cheekbones there's like three little scars that are all kind of running parallel to each other and they kind of cut to a church that's on the emperor's planet and he has like she's like there kind of praying because she's worried about what's happening we'll circle back when we actually discuss the main plot line but i just thought that was a really like these small details like we've always been harping <laughs> even see that just inform more about your characters that you may lose if you were just reading it in a book because you wouldn't be able to see these small details play out in like an actual, you know, in a moving image, right? <laughs> you have to imagine it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and books are always just, they're just more work than TV film. You know what I mean? That's just, just what it is, but it's really cool. Both versions offer something different. Um, but I mean, it's those, you know, I, I wish I knew more about like costume and I guess symbolism in that sense, if there is any, but in the regard to like where there's certain you know like styles come from you know what i mean but th but the even if you don't understand exactly what they're trying to get at it's very distinct you can see someone and you know who they're affiliated with by how they're dressing and that's so important i mean it's because this is a visual tool right it's a visual art form so being able to see those things and not have to think about it or like figure it out or take a second and be like well who are his friends is that you just understand yeah just what they're wearing out they don't have to say anything they just want you can have six people walk into a room all wearing different clothes and know who they're friends with and i think that's tight it's just genius honestly yeah um, i mean it's like storytelling shorthand right like you get to see like you okay it's not even, say, I was going to say like side A and side B, like good versus bad. And that's typically like how the easy way to do it, right? Like black versus white is typically like how they choose those things. But in this sense, you get like a diversity of colors and styles and hoods or no hoods and whatnot like that. And it's really cool. And I think one of the things that I really enjoy about like sci-fi like this is you get this like, like the grand opening kind of thing, like feel where you get to see like from the perspective of the off-worlder because we're a lot like the main character in this sense because we've never been exposed to this world and you get to see like them leaving the place they're comfortable with and it's kind of gail at least is kind of about to leave and you don't really know why it seems to be like this bittersweet moment really like you're you're kind of she's having a conversation with her mother but you're not really sure what going on <laughs> at least i didn't catch it at, just from what they were saying and like she was getting dirty looks from her own people uh, and you don't really understand that either, <laughs> but then she leaves and you get this, the first look at one of the big spaceships, which I forget what they called them. They're like warp drivers or something like that. Uh, I can't remember if we look it up, but, uh, you get this really cool look of her kind of becoming a spacefaring person and like the different type of people and just how they traverse across many light years and 
like they mentioned a couple times like 50,000 light years they can travel in hours probably like it's just kind of crazy <laughs> really i mean dude just nerding out but all this stuff is cool like <laughs> it's just it's just like so interesting and like in conversations me and you have had outside of this you know and like i think i texted you at like my time like 11 p.m yesterday like dude space is so crazy <laughs> and then you just flooded my text with like all these things and i'm like it's crazier than i thought <laughs> but it's like having like so like we've been in this uh headspace in a sense you know like interested with these things but then you know seeing the idea of traveling light years and uh, mere hours or even i think they said uh, jumping ahead a little bit but at the end they they mentioned like you're gonna travel to like the fringes of the galaxy or the solar system or whatever and you're not gonna have jump what's it called jump technology whatever yeah, like called. jump drives or something i don't remember what they actually called it <laughs> yeah and we're not going to give you that and they're like oh it's going to take 800 days i'm like that's still fucking fast to go like however far they go they're like thousands of light years away so it's just cool it's cool to see things like that like i, I really do like the genre it's just interesting but I, I was trying to look up if i can find the name of that ship i don't know if that'll be important but there's an important thing that happens if we want to go so basically after that happens you know she she you know, says goodbye to her her world, essentially. She's leaving. Her home world is called Synex. S-Y-N-N-A-X. And she's heading to the capital called Trantor. Trantor. Oh, that's the capital. Okay. So this was one thing I'll make a note before we move on. A lot of the stuff, while like as it was happening, I was kind of like still piecing things together. Like I was still trying to figure out what that initial, the opening scene was with the 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 vault so it's called and i was mm -hmm. still processing that and then it kind of moved not quickly but it moved on to the next thing and then yeah, it just like, moved away from it it kind of like prefaced it as like a like a dangling a carrot i guess but it didn't elaborate but it will <laughs> yeah. and so i was gonna say because as the episode went on then the prior thing like setups that happened in the beginning all started to like make more sense you know what i mean so that's a good thing of exposition they kept bringing things back then and just say it and forget it and hope you got it. They're like, no, no, we're going to have callbacks. You're going to, you'll be on the same page, at least where we want you to be. So yeah, but when she's, when she's on the ship traveling to Trantor, the, you know, there's a, I don't know who this person was, but someone who was on the ship with her. Like an ad administrator of some kind that makes sure people are like, they have to like go into hibernation during like jump space, they call it. Yeah. I'm not, they don't really elaborate why that's the case, but she woke up in the middle of it and then she gets noticed by the admins like, hey, you shouldn't be awake or aware, I think she called it. And yeah. it looks, it almost looks like an android too. Like, they don't super elaborate on this, but a lot of people are clones or they have cloning technology in some, in some form. And we'll elaborate on that in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they don't, yeah, they don't really say anything explicitly. They're kind of just like, you know, these things are not, probably not human, especially because if, you know, she's not supposed to be awake, the thing that saw her was, and it was kind of like hovering over the people as they hibernated. So, uh, it just looked like the, someone who is <laughs> like the maintenance person, making sure everything was good. You know yeah, I mean? more or less. <laughs> yeah. But to me, that was interesting, right? Like that happens. And then, but they don't tell you unless, unless we miss it, which we, we might've, but you know, they don't really say like, oh, you're supposed to be sleeping because, or it's yeah. only the chosen, I don't know if it's going to be like prophetic type show, but like the chosen one wakes up during jump space. They don't say any, they don't give you any of that. So, you know, it's weird because of the reaction, but it's a question mark. Right. So I feel like as we'll move through the episode, you, we'll come to see, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like what's going on? Um, so yeah. So then, and you were, you were nerding out about this part a little bit, <laughs> but, uh, when they finally, you know, get to where they go, the, the planet Trantar. There's this huge like tower, right? And it's just uh, also VFX, dope. <laughs> Nailed it. Dope. Like just good job. But this huge tower, and you were saying before they even said anything about it, you're like space elevator. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what that is. And I'm like, oh, and then I saw it because I was a little bit behind you. Yeah, you're like, like, like 30 seconds or so behind me. Yeah, and I was like, oh shit, that is dope. So essentially what that is, it's a way to like transport people. It's like a Think of it like the airport, right? And then you have like shuttle buses that take you to where you're going. That's essentially what the space elevator is, except it's miles, hundreds, probably miles in the sky. 
Yeah. And, and they shoot people down into the city or the planet or wherever they're going. And it takes them 14 hours to drop from the space station. So that's insane. Like, just think about how long that has to be. If it still takes 14 hours to go from the top of the station to the bottom or not even the bottom, they said, because this is like the city of Trantor or I mean, the planet of Trantor, really, because it's just one massive city. This is where, or at least the way I'm calling it, is where the idea of Coruscant from Star Wars came from. This is the home world of the Republic, which has also got city over all of it. But the, in all of these types of like planet cities, mega megaopolises, <laughs> if you want to call it that, they, they just build on top of each other. They're so vast that the city is completely covered in urban landscape. And the only way that you can tell from being rich versus poor is when you live on the upper side of the city or the lower side, like it's, you're, you either live on this, you know, the surface or underground, all of it, right. or really the old city <laughs> is what it comes down to it. I, th I love that idea. I just think it's such a fascinating, like all these old school, like we were mentioned earlier, is like all these old or new ideas are just being reintroduced in new forms. <laughs> Right. And I mean, that's again, that this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is something about sci-fi that is that good sci-fi writers do is make things relatable in a sense, because it's so unrelatable totally. But then you have these aspects of like these, uh, cities that are built on like a hierarchy from like literally lower to top, like that, that's a real world. Like that's, we have that, you know, especially in LA, like you can see it, like if you live in the Hills, that's where you have the money, you know what I mean? And like, usually downtown is a little lower is well it's changing now but it used to like not be that you know what i mean with like you know skid row over here and stuff so yeah it's, it's concepts that people can realize even in parasite you've seen yeah we, yep, watched, we watched that but that was a big you know part of that like when the when the city flooded and or the neighborhood whatever flooded in parasite like the people at top were fine but then you know the pe the protagonists they had to rush home to save their stuff because the water is flowing downhill so it's just uh those kind of small little things, but it's just easy to understand like the underworld type. Yeah. Like you can intuit these things because it's, it's like the same as our reality, just like blown out in a different way. Like it's, you take the proportion or the scope of it and you just, you know, crank it as high as you can and be like, well, what happens if this, you know, lasts for 10,000 years? Because that's technically where this show is, where some like 12,000 years into the, I mean, it's not really, it's human. Yeah. 12,067 uh, is okay. the year. So it's imperial era, but okay. we're talking very far future. <laughs> yeah, definitely really far, which is, I mean, it's cool that it's still, you know, we can still relate to it and you have to, you're telling a story to, you know, we have to be able to connect somehow. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which brings me to this next point. I want to, it's pretty much the next thing that comes up and they introduce what I'm assuming to be the antagonist. It's a really cool setup. It's not anything I can off the top of my mind think I've seen before, how they set this up, which is really interesting. They call them empire, right? So it's like the rulers of Trantar and basically what they are, you know, we mentioned this earlier with cloning. It's like the clone, it's like they continuously, and tell me if I'm explaining this wrong, but they continuously clone whoever the initial emperor was, right. And they have like certain derivatives of this person. So. There's like three sitting rulers, right? All referred to as empire individually or as a group. Then you have dawn, day, and dusk. So what they represent is dawn is like the young child version of this person. And they're like grooming him and teaching him what it is to be the next line of succession, right? And then you have day who's like the, he's like middle age, maybe like 30, 40 years old, something like that. And he's like the current ruler. And then you have dusk who's, you know, the one on his way out. He's like serving as mentor to both of them. Like his time has came and gone. And that is one of the coolest things I've ever fucking seen to make an antagonist. Cause you have these three different identities, all really embodying the same, not even the same person, but the same like intellect and thought process. Yeah, yeah. They share all these same ideas. At least from an imperial setup too, right? Like what better way to create an empire than to have a never ending line of clones that will always forever, you know, behave and act with, with the same ideals in mind, right? Like it seems like a foolproof way to keep yourself in power. <laughs> Literally yourself in power. It's not like, not my child. There's no line of succession. 
You know what I mean? Well, I guess in a sense there is, but it's not like I need to have a son. My firstborn son takes the, no, no, they're like, no, it'll just be me forever. Like, then I know he won't do something stupid because right. it's me. <laughs> like, and like, I don't know. I thought it was cool. Like the scene that you get to meet all three of them, they're like eating breakfast kind of. And it's like really different too. Like everything you've seen up to this is kind of like, I was going to say generic sci-fi, but like your standard sci-fi of like ships and some screens and like LED stuff. But then all of a sudden you get to this like, royal imperial house and all of a sudden it feels like you're back into like ancient greece and you got like this wide open like it's like house but then it's like the windows there's no walls and you just see like sunlight coming through the one side of the room in like this really grandiose table and they're all eating like fruit and like grapes and stuff and it's like really like everything is just blown out of proportion with fanciness like yeah. everything's gilded in gold and whatnot like it's it kind of juxtaposed. I'm like, oh man, he's like really pulling on the like Greek themes here of just to showing like the maybe it's not decadence is not the word, but like the maybe the grandiosity of the empire. That's a really cool thing too. And and before I forget, uh, you brought up earlier how the protagonist, Gail, we kind of like she serves as the audience conduit, I guess, in a sense, where we like they're filtering information to her that's really meant for us, right? Yes, yeah. the position, right? They're doing the same thing with Dawn. Yes. Right. So that's helping us understand, you know, that these people are clones and they're kind of doing that whole spiel to him and teaching him like, this is what's right and this is what isn't and brush your hair and type thing, you know, but we're just kind of learning how their dynamics are through the child who's being trained by them. So it's really the smart tool because then it's like, you have a way to explain things. That's not just like a narrator. Yeah. <laughs> we'll say they do use a narrator, but it's uh, pretty sparse, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's cool. Their dynamic is, is different, but you, it's, it's, it's similar enough that you get it. You know what I mean? This is the <laughs> idea of like, you know, you have your, uh, we talked about it in C like where you kind of have your typical evil ruler or whatever. This is at least it seems in episode one, it might change, but it seems in episode one, this is what we're dealing with. Like we have these selfish, greedy, just evil people that are they just want like to keep themselves in power. Right. That's what it feels like. You know, it's like, I guess it's your more, your standard imperial behavior. Right. <laughs> right. But still it's cool. Cause I've never seen something like this before, but they mm. themselves. It's just, it's an interesting dynamic. And a prediction I have is that the kid or Dawn is going to stray. Mm. That's my prediction. Who knows, but I have a feeling. That's interesting. I would not have expected that, but I can see that in some sense. Like to me, Day feels very cynical. Like mm -hmm. he asked like a lesson. It's weird. It's like in that uh, breakfast scene, he kind of like tells this story and then he kind of like reprimands uh, Dusk or Day. No, Dawn. Sorry. I'm getting a little confused. <laughs> but he he kind of reprimands him. He's like, no, that story is not that. It's just something about like a boy's first experience with the woman. And then he goes like, not every story is a teachable moment. And I'm like, well, that's cynical. I just get this like really sense of like political conniving, like scheming, just kind of like always kind of seeing everything through a political lens, no matter, even if it's not actually a political move and we'll get, there's another scene where they talk about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, I think I know what you're talking about, but yeah, I mean, there's, I think what, what this is doing and what we're seeing is like a, a, I guess commentary or yeah, commentary works on modern politics. And that's what I, that's why I was bringing up. I wonder if this was made around world war two, because you have all these ideologues right today, or everyone thinks the same. And like it, the problem of if someone thinks one way about something, you can predict how they think about everything. Now in this world, you have literally a clone of the same person, all thinking the same way about the same. It's not even like you have to, I mean, they're teaching them, but it's like, but you're me. So like, I just got to teach you how the world works and you're going to, we're the same person. Right. Um, you, you'll come to the same decisions as I would anyways. Right. So like, it's like a nice little like comparison about like the danger of what that is. And you get this cynical person who it clearly is all about himself and power and things yeah. like that. That's interesting. Yeah. And it's funny, we've talked, we've talked this long and haven't even really got to the exciting incident yet. <laughs> like, right. What, I know. <laughs> like what the show is. How much uh, world building there is in just this one episode, right? <laughs> this, I mean, as we're explaining, there's so much to talk about and there's so many questions. So the inciting incident, I guess, um, jumping forward just a little bit is you have Gail and she 
I don't know if we mentioned, but she's like a genius, right? She's like a mathematician technically. Yeah. Like a prodigy, right? So she's just numbers and all this stuff. Like she's incredibly smart. And the reason she gets called to Trantar is because the head professor at a university there, I forget the name of the university. It starts with an S. Uh, I'm not going to try it. It starts with an S I promise, but he, he's this incredibly smart professor. I think he's like esteemed to be one of the smartest people in the galaxy, something like that. Harry Sheldon. And he's played by one of our favorite actors, Jared Harris. Yeah. And he's awesome. So he was, he was the lead in Chernobyl and also played in Mad Men. He's a phenomenal actor. Even in this, I'm like, dude, he, he's just, I think he sells it. He sells yeah. it so good. <laughs> I mean, you just like lean forward when he's on the screen. You know what I mean? I feel like the emotion he like can exude at specific moments, like he's calm and like even keel and then like can like lay it on, but like subtle, like not like, whoa, but like subtle, but it's like you feel that the, the passion behind whatever it is, his character is portraying. He's a phenomenal actor, man. Like anything I, like I think I'm going to watch. <laughs> <laughs> like, Honestly, that's part of the reason why I really wanted to watch this. Like I wasn't sure how well it was going to do. And then I was like, oh, I saw him as one of the main characters in a trailer. Like I didn't watch it with volume i just saw like the flashing images and i'm like oh i'm in if he's in it i'm good <laughs> i'm all in um, and that isn't to say the other actors aren't great but he's just really good too um then again one of our you know we we like this guy a lot but anyway so yeah this guy's like you know incredibly smart and uh the head of this university so he he invites gail to the university as a, to be a student because she figured out some impossible equation, right? And I forget what it's called. I think he called it like some conjecture. I'm not sure what the specific, I'm trying to look at the, it's like, yeah. it's like a model that he, complex conjecture, he called it. So she figured out this equation called Abraxas, right? And, and no one else has been able to figure this out. And, you know, he found out, so he calls her there. And so they're, they're having a meeting and pretty quickly. You know, he's, you know, questioning, how'd you do this? And what led you to this? And da, da, da. And she's just, you can tell she's just like this prodigy, right? Like just smart, can figure out things, ways that other like normal people can't, and especially on her home world, which is very religious based, like to the point where we mentioned earlier, people were looking at her the wrong ways because she's this mathematician and that's like heresy to them. So just to understand where she comes from, cause I bring this up and I was kind of lost at this scene. But she was coming from a place where they literally would kill these intellects, right? Because it was against, it was heresy, you know, it was against their religion and stuff like that, which speaks, you know, to her, whatever, her markings, her scars that she got removed because she was like, I'm leaving this world. I'm entering the world of intellectuals or math and science. So, you know, she, in their meeting, they mentioned that she was lonely there because no one thinks like her, because she was figuring out all these things and trying to see how the world works. And no one thought like that, right? It was all faith-based and so he was like okay interesting cool I'll figure this out and then he just throws it on and he's like yeah so for that reason you're going to be arrested <laughs> she's, like, <laughs> she's like bro so like just look at this girl is trapped right she goes from a world where she was left you know she's an outsider complete faith-based society going to a place where now because she's smart now they're going to throw her in jail because she figured it out so it's like she, this girl can't win right I, I guess we should say too that he's, so the reason this is like a big deal. So the field of mathematics that he's, he's created or is like his area of study is called psychohistory. And they elaborated pretty well late in a, in a few scenes in a, in a second here, but we'll just to go ahead and describe it here. But basically it's a, a way of using statistics to look at larger groups of people and generating a predictive model of what may or may not happen in the future. And really what this means is that the predictive model they have is that basically uh, the world is going to collapse. Like the entire civilization this empire is keeping in under control is going to fall apart. And I believe he's going to say 500 years. Is that correct? Yeah, five, that's the timeline. And yeah. so that's part of why they're, that all of this is happening. Like why she's being called to this capital planet to study under him is because the they l looked at the data or something and they say they saw that she would might be a person who would disprove this theory. And, and if she decides that she like, and it's a political maneuver in general, it's just, if she basically decides to betray this professor and the mathematics realistically and the science, she could save herself or she could not. And it's, you know, whether or not basically you trust science or if you believe in superstition. Right. 
Right. And it, it's it, what's happening too, is he's like, they keep reinforcing. He's not wrong. He's not like everyone who believes in this guy. Uh, shit. I'm forgetting his name again. Sorry. Uh, what's his name? Sheldon. Sheldon. Yeah. <laughs> so there's so many names that people get introduced, but yeah. So Sheldon, any, anyone who follows him says like, he's not wrong. Like he's not wrong in his predictions. Right. So basically, you know, the empire, whatever they're coming to, uh, Gail and saying, prove him wrong and he dies or don't prove him wrong and you die. So that's kind of the place she's in. And it sucks because I, I think she initially looks, you know, figures out his equation or something like that. Cause she's a fucking genius and figures it out. And she's like, shit, he's right. <laughs> like he's just correct. It, it's going to happen. I mean, he's almost saying like, there's no shred of doubt. This is the empire is going to fall. And then we'll be in like 30 years of essentially hell, like the worst things you can imagine. Yeah. Like, there's, you know, destabilization, things like that. It's like a dark age, but think of that, like on steroids, instead of going from space faring, like from like our dark ages that we have in our history, it'd be more like you had space faring technology and you had multiple star systems to, oh, now all of you hate each other and you don't know how to like figure it out anymore. Like you go back to pitchforks and torches. So those are the stakes, right? They're literally galactic stakes that it's like. And the interesting thing is like the world, this is going to end. He's like, he says that there's nothing we can do to stop it, but what his, you know, and I'm moving forward. So sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. I'll text there. So after, you know, they essentially arrest her. Right. And then they bring him to like a trial I and mean, they kind of have him on what their version of being like on the stand would be. Then they're questioning him and, you know, they're trying to figure out like, well, how do you know? And he, he's saying things like, well, I know. And they're like, well, can you explain it to anyone? And he's like, no one else can understand this. Cause that's how complex this equation is except for Gail. Right. So they're like, Gail, you have to basically saying like, you have to prove him wrong. Is there any chance? And he's like this, we can't do anything to stop this. Right. Like it's going to happen. What we can do is possibly delay it and make the, the consequences less severe. Yeah. Like recover quicker, I think. And yeah. I forget what the time, I think it was like a thousand years was his prediction. If, if they build like his, his plan, it would yeah. lessen the impact of this. Cause I think it said like 30,000 years, the dark age would last. Yeah. Or if they follow through with the foundation, they will lessen the impact of this dark age by, I think reduce that to 1000 years, I believe. Yep. And, and so the reason this empire doesn't like the idea of the foundation though, is that the empire's rebuttal is like, well, we already have a place that we store knowledge. It's called the empire's library. And Sheldon said, well, the empire will be gone when this happens. So you will lose all of that. And so what we need to do is go build a separate repository of knowledge that is accessible to anyone by anyone. And that will become, you know, the foundation of humanity to allow them to rebuild. So they have at least, you know, some knowledge to return or build upon rather than having to rediscover it all over again. Yeah. And I just, it's, you know, it's such a cool concept, honestly. <laughs> it's the line that made it for me was he says, we based something along the lines of, we don't want them to have to rediscover the, the wheel instead, just here it is. And I'm like, that is a really dope concept. And. I don't know about you, but my mind instantly jumped to like the pyramids and all these like ancient wonders and things like that. And I was like, this is a cool concept to think about. Like, well, what if that's what that was? And that's how they figured out how to do this. Yeah. I'm not saying it is, but I'm just, saying, I'm just saying it was like a cool kind of connection. And I'm like, that's a really smart idea on how to essentially he's trying to preserve humanity, right? Like mm -hmm. way past this time. He's not doing it for selfish reasons, at least externally that we can see for now. He's saying we're going to die but let's make it easier for the ones who come after us. Yeah. And I think, so this is one of the questions we had, or, or rather the, the characters of the Imperial had that I leaves you questioning as the, as the audience member, because the tone kind of shifts, they, they kind of grill him on a question and say, are you revolutionary? And he's like, no, I'm clearly not. I'm just here trying to preserve what we can before the inevitable. And then I don't know, it just kind of, kind of lingers and all of a sudden his tone kind of changes at least after this trial where it's like, he's been kind of pulling strings or, or it seems like he's been pulling tr strings to some degree as to how this is all playing out. Yeah. 
Yeah, and pulling strings in the sense where he he says a line where like even though he can predict the future, it's on only large scale events, right? right. We didn't elaborate on that part. Yeah, yeah, but I, that's important to what we're saying here, right? Because he's like, I don't know what a specific person is going to do, and they're like, oh, well, what about eight million or something people? And he's like, yeah, I can do that. But what's interesting is that he was able to predict certain things that happened concerning to Gail. Like he knew that the the empire also knew that she figured out this equation. So they were also going to try to invite her there, but he just beat them to it, right? Because he knew they were going to. Another point is that he had this artifact. I don't think they really describe it. it, it it's really quick. It's really quick. And I forget that the, I have the I have the summary. I keep looking over here. I have the summary pulled up, but I don't know if I'll be able to find it that. Prime Radiant? That's yeah, kind of, it is. It is? Okay. I'll yeah. The Prime Radiant. Okay. It looks really cool. It looks like the, so the way a lot of these like animations look to like display things is kind of like, it's almost like sand, but the sand like emanates from these devices to make images. Like it's a whole bunch of particles that glow in distinct ways to kind of display information. And this one is like, it looks very astrological where it like looks like a lot of rotating circles and orbs and stuff but they don't really describe it in any sense for like the audience to look at it. they mostly have the the characters who know how to interpret it looking at it for some time and then they close like turn it off and yeah. then it's they have some insight now and then you'll have to wait to see how they apply said insight <laughs> i know that they describe it briefly as just like where he puts his equation like he put his equation into this thing and that's what it is and that's just what we got um so he you know she shows it to him or he shows it to her and I guess when he gets arrested, you know, the, the Imperials or whatever, they take it from him and then give it to her, like, figure it out. Well, he knew they were going to do that. And she calls him out on it. She's like, you knew they were going to give this to me because you wanted me to figure this out, that they're, that this was inevitable, right? So it just goes to show that he's, you know, he's saying he doesn't have any selfish ideas. He's not a revolutionary. He also can't predict specific things that are going to happen, but he's already contradicted himself because he had this whole episode, he has been predicting things that are going to happen. And I guess this is where we should probably tell, like, one of the most deviant behaviors in all of the episode, in all in the entire episode, right? You're talking about the crazy scene? Yeah. I guess we should preface it, too, because we forgot to the, highlight the meeting that the Emperor had. There was the two planets that gave a gift to the Empire because there was some dispute of an asteroid, it seems like. there's It's not very clear. So there's, there's a scene, I think it's right after this trial scene basically where they had the emperor meet uh and that was the day persona he's meeting with these two houses and, and prior to this they had showed them around the royal home or the imperial mansion basically but the important thing is they basically highlight like the I guess ritual that goes around like appeasing the emperor and it's very much old school where they have to show a gift like an envoy of like something valuable to their planet and so the one one tribe uh who who looks very much like their style of dress reminds me of like somewhat japanese but all of the 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 clothing is kind of like little pieces of like maybe leather stitched together into like plates so it's very unique and then the other one is, like, these really intri intricate dresses with an interesting, like, disc hat. Very ceremonial looking. But each one of them gives a gift. One gives, like, a bow of, like, their oldest tree. The other one gives, like, a... I don't even know. It looks like a, like a roll or a scroll of some kind. I don't, I don't really describe it too well there. But they give it these gifts. And he's, like, he goes through the formalities of it. But he look, clearly looks down upon these two groups. And then in the next scene, he has this conversation with Don and has him kind of like looking at these gifts from the envoys and they're kind of talking about them. And the one he knows, though, is the scroll and it has metal and the metal is from this asteroid in question. And so uh, Day is basically saying, well, this is basically the politics of art in some sense. Or what did he call it? It's like it, art is just the the creative Art, he says, art is just politics with a sweeter tongue. I think there you go. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And I like it. I don't agree with it, but I like it. <laughs> I, so I don't know if I agree. Actually, I think I do. I think I, I don't know. I, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like torn, honestly. <laughs> I, I think not all art, but in the sense of like, 
propaganda type yeah. thing. Like you can sway people in an artistic way, gentler than like speaking to them or, you know, preaching or whatever. You can sway people like, oh, I'm going to show you this piece of art or whatever. And that's going to sway your opinion in the way I want you to. Yeah. So in that sense, maybe it's, it's a, it's a dope line though. Yeah. <laughs> at the very least. But yeah. It's, it's an interesting line. And I, and I, you know, it makes you stop and think like, hmm. Like, I don't know. I just start thinking of examples in, in our lives. Where do we know of that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I guess maybe the thinking of like the picture of the Tiananmen Square where the single man with groceries in his hand stops in front of a tank. Yeah. And like, you know, what does that signify, right? Like it, it, it says a lot. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it too, it speaks to his character, right? At the very mm -hmm. least. You kind of, you see who you're dealing with. Again, cynical. You know, he doesn't really trust anyone. He thinks he's above everyone. Again, that hierarchy you know, discussion. Yeah. Uh, it was a dope. I'm glad you pointed it out. Cause I might've like went right over that, but yeah. yeah. And so the reason I had to preface that part though, is there's kind of like post trial scene. They have like both Gail and Sheldon heading back to their, I guess, prison cells or, or, and I don't really know. It's kind of like in limbo. Like they, they think that even though they've given their, their spiels and defied Imperial decree, they're probably both going to get executed is the thought. And then all of a sudden you kind of see these like scenes around the space station and you kind of get a look at these figures that are looking a little shifty. And all of a sudden they say words that are not in languages we can understand. And then they explode. And the explosions take place at two different sections on the um, space elevator. One is higher up and one is like in the middle of an elevator shaft, like probably it's pretty high up, but basically they've destroyed the space elevator and they say it like this scene is really well done. It's really like, it's all done with music and solo motion. And you just see all the damage of like a giant statue getting destroyed. It's it, you just get, Oh shit. Like <laughs> this is not a good situation right now. Like everything is falling apart. Literally. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of devastating how they show it. Like they show individual people, like as they're riding the elevator down, and it becomes unhinged and like their, their elevator boxes or whatever you want to call them become untouched from the tower. And they're like falling from the atmosphere, you know, like way high in the, the sky. So they're like, you know, it's just, it's pretty intense and it was dope. And I'm like, oh, they got budget. As a friend, when I was like, I'm like, this show's got a budget, like <laughs> to do that in the pilot, yeah. which, which we never mentioned who these writers are. Creative. Oh yeah. We should probably because the, they, it's, they, so you have a pretty kick-ass team. <laughs> so it was written and directed also by David S. Goyer. And he is responsible for, I mean, you might've heard of this movie, Dark Knight, um, Batman Begins. What else? There's another big one. Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of, Dawn of Justice, the, the most recent Godzilla movies. For video game fans, he wrote Call of Duty Black Ops and Black Ops 2. I mean, this guy has a, a resume, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a resume. And the other guy, let me go back here just to make sure I get it right. His name is Josh Friedman, and he's responsible for other great things like Terminator and Snowpiercer, the series, if anyone's heard of that. Yeah, you were uh, saying it was dope as you're just starting this. Yeah, yeah, it's really dope. It's made by the guy who Bong Joon, who, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I, I apologize, but he made Parasite, but he had this movie called Snowpiercer that got a spinoff uh, TV show and Fried, Friedman is a part of that writing team. So, I mean, these guys are just like juggernauts, I guess you can say of in, in, in the industry. I mean, uh, just the fact that David S. Goyer has so many roles on this project, he's just willing it into being. Right. right. <laughs> Like, it's crazy. You normally don't see a guy who's like playing, doing so many hats in, in this kind of stuff. I'm just looking at the, uh, the Wikipedia page for this series too. And there's a couple more like production notes. So in August of 2018, they had Robin Asimov, who's Asimov's daughter would serve as executive producer on this project. So they have blessing from the family to make this into a show, which is really cool. And then on a writing note, so in January of 2021, Goyer stated that with Foundation, we can tell the story hopefully over the course of 80 episodes, so about 80 hours, as opposed to trying to condense it into two or three hours for a single film. And so I think 
that's really cool. The fact that he said that, and that was in a YouTube channel, uh, or YouTube interview with Lovin Malta in January of this year, 2021. So it's really cool that, I mean, it's really recent. So, you know, it, we have a guy who clearly loves the source material because he's trying to make it into this long-term project to get it done right. Not to try and rush through it and be like, let's just make it a future film and whatever. <laughs> I mean, you get the idea that this is like something he's wanted to do for some time, but like, yeah, he's had this idea. He's probably read the book when he was younger, fell in love with it. And was always like, I'm going to make that. And now here he is making it. And I mean, I didn't know about this series beforehand. So this is my first time seeing it, but it's not like Dune or like Star Wars where you kind of know the original. I've never read the original Dune, but I knew that it was something else. But they, they're doing this with a huge budget, which again, it's just the timing worked out, right? Because Apple TV's budget, as we can see, I mean, we watch C already and there's shows like the morning show, which just has she, like this crazy cast, right? It's Jennifer Anderson, Reese Witherspoon, Steve oh Crow. Yeah, so that's the cast. superstar cast that had. <laughs> and I'm skipping people, but it's crazy. Like them three already, but Apple TV has a huge budget, right? So it's allowing them to, you know, have these beautiful backdrops and all this you know, really cool VFX work. And then just, just devastating, like attack where the yeah. top falls and it, like you feel it it doesn't feel fake it doesn't feel cheaply made it's like i i think i said oh shit like seven times <laughs> you know what i mean like, this is this is to me the clearly the set piece of this episode probably along with showing the elevator for the first time like showing it for the first time and then destroying it is like the two pinnacles and they almost kind of happen at the same exact points in the story no. You know, like one is you enter and then one is this, like this climactic moment of this, this episode or pilot is ending to kind of capstone like, oh, here's where, I mean, realistically, this is where the shit hits the fan. Because then right after that, and then, you know, Empire, as they're called, calls them to, you know, calls Gail and why do I keep forgetting his name? Sheldon. Uh, Sheldon to see them personally, you know, and they're grilling him like. You know, they're basically saying you knew this was going to happen. And he's like, no, I can't predict specific things. But he's kind of like, but I'm not surprised. But it's just, you get this idea that you're like, he's, he's not saying everything he knows, right? That's just the idea you get. Not that he's evil or has maniacal views, but just something else, right? I think he just knows that if he gives everything to these empire people, they're going to kill him anyways. Like, as soon as he outlives his usefulness, they're just going to be like, well, tie that loose end. And in that we go to see that even more because we, you know, basically they have this conversation where the Empire Day is doing most of the grilling, like you're trying to ruin us, blah, 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 all this stuff. And then they get to the point where Sheldon basically is like, look, the way to stall this from happening is to end the cloning process. Right. So that's his, that's, he's like, we have to end that. Obviously Empire's not going to like that because they're like, no, and then, you know, Dusk who's the oldest one. So it makes sense how he would be the most hurt by that is saying like, we've held, you know, made this place stable for 4,000 years. I think he said 4,000 years. Like, why would we get rid of that? And he's saying, if you don't, then it's going to happen quick. Like I love the, the poetic language that Sheldon uses here is pretty good. Uh, he calls it uh all you do is have a, a fresher grape in the same old bottle. And I'm yeah. like, Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a really good analogy or metaphor. And he delivered that nicely, but I mean, good writing too, just all in all. So, so essentially from that, you know, they, they decide, okay, well, we'll let you work on this foundation and build this library, so to speak of knowledge, but we're going to exile you to a distant planet out only, I forget the name of the planet, but they're going to exile them there. And it's super far away from everything. And the, you know. You're free to work on the foundation. And if it doesn't work, then no one will know because you're exiled. And if it does work, cool, we'll bring it back. And then it looks good on us. So it's just like very political move, right? Yeah. Super political, smart. Um, and you know, Gail's kind of like, damn, they're exiling us. Like she's freaking out. And Sheldon here is like, oh, well, I know so much about this planet. I know this, that, and this, and it's got all these good reserves and it has exactly what we need to do what we need to do. I think Gail's like, oh, so you knew they were going to send us here. And he's basically like, well. No, I didn't know what I expected. So it's, again, it's just going back to like, he, I mean, he says that he can't predict, you know, single events, but this whole episode, he's been pretty damn good at predicting single events. So it, it just leaves this big question, right? At the end, like what, what are his real intentions? And then it closes with even more questions because we, the thing we forgot about this whole time comes back. 
<laughs> or, or rather, what opened this whole episode comes back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then uh, Gail kind of becomes a narrator for us at the very like last sequence of scenes. And they show this. I forget. They say her name, but I can't remember her name. Salver Hard. So she's kind of walking up to this, the vault without being affected by it. And she kind of touches it and it glows. And as that's happening, it's being narrated that Sheldon didn't want us or me to find out what was inside of this vault. And you're like, what? This is, doesn't make any sense. So many more questions than answers. <laughs> so I, I assume that's Terminus too, by the way, that planet. Terminus. Yes. Yes. That that is the planet that we're, our two main characters are heading to that yeah. this person is already on. And I mean, it's just, it's, and there's so many questions. There's so many questions. It's like, well, what is, what is the vault? Is it cause I don't know if, I don't know if you mentioned this, but when they, you know, do this ending scene talking, uh, and Gail's narrating Salvor, that's 35 years in the future from what we've seen with the, the oh, elevator. I didn't catch that. Yeah. So it's 30, so it's in the future. And so I don't know if the vault is the finished product, right? I don't, I, they don't say that. Right. So we can have our predictions that the vault is the finished product of what they went there to build. And for some reason, Gail says, you know, Salver interacting with it and finding out what's inside is his biggest fear, but it's like, why? Because yeah. I thought that was the point. So it's questions that I'm sure will be answered. Yeah. I also want to make a note here too, that apparently this whole story takes place over a thousand years. So there's going to be some time jumping here and there. Uh. <laughs> so that's why they're jumping from like 35 years in the future where, you know, normally it was like maybe five years in the, or, you know, a couple handful of years. So that's probably why this time jumping seems weird. So we're going to have to pay attention to that. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to keep track because that can get really confusing. Because, I mean, we were watching and we were like, wait, what? But yeah, I mean, I guess now I'll just give overall thoughts of the pilot. And I, I really liked it. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was good writing. I thought they handled exposition well. There are a lot of questions and that I, I trust these writers enough, just knowing their previous work that it'll like, you'll, they'll be answered when they're supposed to be answered. But a part of me, I just like, you know, from other TV shows that might, I won't say which ones, but won't haven't, weren't as handled as nicely or tactfully where you have all these questions and then not all of them get answered. So that's one thing that's like, it makes me nervous. Cause I'm like, I'm, it could go either amazing or come short, but. I have faith. It's really good. At the very least, it'll be fun to watch. We kind of saw how, what the budget can do. Again, it's, it's really beautiful VF, VFX work. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm in. It, it, this is dope. This is kind of exactly what I was hoping for. Yeah, I think I, I think after reading some of the stuff that I didn't even know, just from what we've been talking about here, knowing that he's trying to do this in long form, I'm not super worried about the questions we have because he's not trying to do too much too fast. What a story, you know, letting these ideas breathe, I think is, or the question marks breathe. I think sometimes you can try to force things too much so that you have to answer things right away. Cause you're not trusting your audience to be like confused for a little while. Be like, don't worry, it'll pay off. <laughs> <laughs> like you're kind of supposed to be confused because that's like, that's what keeps you coming back. At least that's why I like sci-fi and, and like mystery novels or thriller novels. It's like not like trying to put the pieces together before it happens or predicting it for yourself. Ironically, that this show is all about predicting the future. Like it's like, that's what keeps you coming back for more is like, how is this going to play out? Like that, that excitement of like wanting it to play out one way and not really sure how it's going to go. And then, you know, the, getting that little bit of rush when you see things playing out, like I think seeing the, the elevator be destroyed and like this, almost like this thing he was predicting coming to fruition sooner rather than later. You know, he's like, well, now the emperor can bleed, breed, eh. the, now the empire can bleed is kind of what this first episode showed. So it's like, maybe they're not as like stable as they pretend to be, you know, maybe they're, you know, they have a nice shiny coat of paint on them, but underneath the surface, I think he gave that quote. He's like said a tree, a tree or a rotten tree looks good, good until it's, you know, hit by rain or, or a storm and then it cracks. Right. And, and it, I think that's a good analogy in the situation. Yeah. Yeah. He is. I mean, I feel like they save all the best lines for this guy. <laughs> like, you know, I feel like he has all the dopest lines outside of the, the poetry art one. I mean, damn, <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm, I'm in just, just for the fact it's, uh, 
uh, Jared. Dude, I'm so bad with names today, man. Jared like, Ferris. Jared Ferris. <laughs> Dude, me and names are like not not best friends. I'm really bad with names. But so good. This is practice right here. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> this is definitely practice. But I mean, yeah, I'm excited. It's it. The story seems very engaging and smart too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm in. Cool. Well, to be continued, episode one in the books.